can continue to innovate, we don't see any end. So listen here carefully. It seems like these days there's so many people and so many companies trying so hard to be like everybody else that they forget to be themselves. But not Sony though, it does seem that actually Sony go out of their way sometimes to be different and some might call this a little bit weird and I personally respect that because who wants to be like everybody else anyway. In this video I've done my best to find 10 weird and wacky Sony gadgets some of which might leave you wondering why did they even make that. So get ready to be amazed and possibly even confused as we dive into the strange world of the one and only Sony. You certainly know where to go to test your product Miss Morita. <laughs> That's a nice place to take I thought you would take pictures of Japanese yen or the industrial might of your country or something. Number one, it seems fitting to start with the first ever Sony product. And in fact, it was so early on that it actually wasn't Sony branded. Back then, the company was known as Tokyo Sushin Kogyo. So we now know Sony as a company that makes TVs, Playstations, cameras, sensors, as well as movies and music and of course audio devices amongst many other things. But did you know, strangely, Sony's first ever device was designed to make rice. It consisted of a wooden tub with spiral electrodes at its base. The idea was that the wet rice would complete the electrical circuit, causing it to heat up. And once the rice had cooked and dried, the circuit would break automatically stopping the cooking process. And Sony did make a few different prototypes, but none of them seemed to work that well. The rice always turned out overcooked or undercooked, never quite perfect. And at one point they even tried to turn it into a bread maker, but that didn't really work either. And then what they did next was kind of genius. They took the electrodes that they couldn't really sell with the rice cooker and got the women in the company to stitch them into pads, turning them into heating pads and they sold them in the street market. And this brought some money into the company. And before we move on to the next one, I just wanna say I'm very glad that Sony at this point went down the tech route because the other ideas on the table might have taken the company down a different path. For example, one of the ideas on the table at the time was to lease some land in bombed out Tokyo and build a mini golf course. And another idea was to make and sell sweet bean paste cakes. Who knows what the Sony Corporation would look like today if they did decide to choose one of those other ideas instead of the rice cooker. And for those of you wondering when Sony's success story started, it was actually not long after the rice cooker when the more senior co-founder member of the company, Masuru Ibuka, invented a modification device for a medium wave radio that would allow it to pick up short wave radio. And he built this device using parts that he bought off the black market, making him kind of a Japanese Tony Stark in a way. He sort of made this in a cave with a box of scraps. And the timing of this invention was key because prior to it, it was actually illegal to pick up shortwave radio. So he capitalized on an empty market. Anyway, now let's fast forward 37 years. If you're a Sony fan, let me know in the comments below. And also, I'm gonna tell you something you probably already know but the Sony Walkman was the first product to take the company to the next level, the highest of highs in the 80s. But did you ever hear about the Super Walkman, codename WM10? And you know Sony love a good codename. And back then it was just four digits, simpler times I guess. Anyway, what made this one strange, but genius at the same time, was the fact that it was so small. In fact, it was almost as small as a cassette case. And in fact, the official advert for this Walkman shows them placing the components into a cassette case. And at the time they launched it, it was the smallest Walkman ever. Maybe it still is. Let me know in the comments below if you know if that's true or not. So here's what's weird about the Walkman WM10. It was so small in its resting state that it couldn't even actually fit a cassette in it. It extended outwards to fit a cassette when you were ready to listen to one. And this is just so cool. And what amazes me about the design of this particular gadget is that it ran on a single AA battery. But here's a little insight to the innovation behind this. The 1.5 volt battery wasn't actually enough juice to run all of the components. So Sony added a step up DC to DC converter to boost the power. Sounds like another Tony Stark move in my opinion. And real talk now, 
Are there any audio products today that can run on a single AA battery? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're wondering about the battery life on the WM10, I wouldn't imagine it was spectacular by today's standards, but it's still impressive that it could run on just one of those. It's fair to say that this is probably one of the greatest retro audio devices that you can get today. That expanding mechanism helps this rise above the crowd and stand out, and you've got to love it. Number three. Now let's fast forward from the WM10 about a quarter of a century to 2007 when Sony released a speaker that only Sony could come up with. I'm guessing now, but I believe at some point a bunch of Sony executives were around the boardroom table and someone put out an idea and said something like this. Do you know what people need that they don't realize that they need? A dancing speaker. And someone must have thought this was a good idea because the Sony Roly was born. A small egg-shaped speaker that had wheels and rounded wings that flapped and LED strip lights around it with two gigabytes of onboard storage and a Bluetooth receiver built in. This speaker could roll around, hence the name Roly. It also had an accelerometer built in so it could be used upright and I'm told the onboard controls were quite unique as well. The discs would slide out of the way and you could use them to turn up the volume and skip tracks. Out of the box the Roly was pre-programmed to dance to specific tracks and you could download dance routines to its onboard storage and if it didn't recognize the songs it could improvise which is kind of what dancing is all about. Now I must admit the Roly is a strange device undoubtedly unique and it looks pretty cool and is full of life. And you couldn't argue the fact that this Bluetooth speaker isn't more visually entertaining than pretty much any other Bluetooth speaker on the market, even today. But maybe it was just a bit too ahead of his time because as fate would have it, just a couple of years later, Sony stopped making the Roly. It was never gonna dance again off the conveyor belts in the Sony factories. Maybe his worthless feet had got no rhythm. <laughs> That's a bad joke, I'm sorry. I should have known better than to cheat a friend. Today, Sony are deep in the sensor game and many consider their camera sensors to be the best on the planet. So it's fair to say Sony are into sensing things. And during a brainstorming session, one of the Sony geniuses came up with an idea. Based off the fact that Sony make things to look at, they make things to listen to, they make machines that can make food to taste and you can touch the machines. But the one thing they didn't have was something to smell. And if I read this correct, the designers who came up with this described it as a personal headphone experience for your nose. Yes, that sounds crazy, but what Sony were cooking, you'd understand. Yes, this is called the Sony Aromastic, a compact personal aroma device. Now, there was a lot of emphasis from the designers that although the Aromastic looks like a lady's lipstick, Sony did their best to make it a non gender specific product. Further proving the fact that Sony were ahead of their time, hit me up some non-binary emojis in the comments below. I heard that's a thing now. Anyway, in the Aromastic was a special five aroma cartridge and you could twist the device to switch between the smells. If used correctly, this pocketable lipstick smelling device could help change your mood. Yes, this is a bit strange, but it is also strangely innovative because Whenever I smell coffee, it reminds me of my trip to Amsterdam with Sony to check out some Sony soundbox. And I actually vlogged that entire trip with a Sony Xperia 5 Mark IV. And if you want to watch it, I'll link it at the end. But also another smell that triggers something in my mind is the smell of popcorn. It reminds me of the cinema and maybe smelling that at the right time could put me in the right mindset to watch a movie. Like the greatest movie ever made starring Nicolas Cage, Willy's Wonderland. Okay, all jokes aside, that movie was brilliant. You should definitely watch it. But the Aromastic was a good idea, but unlike a bad smell, it didn't stick around for long and it never made it to the US or the European market. Anyway, number five, let's rewind to the turn of the century. And at this point in time, there was a lot of uncertainty around the music industry and it was a strange time. And Sony being a big player in the music industry had to continue to innovate and strange times calls for stranger solutions and of course Sony are no stranger to those. The problem that Sony were trying to solve when they came up with this next product was how do we get people to pay for music instead of sharing it online using apps like Napster? And that's where they came up with this, a $20 keyring called the Sony E-Marker. I have yet to own one of these. 
I looked it up and from what I can gather is that the way the e-marker would work was you pre-program it with your favorite radio stations. And when you heard a song on your favorite radio station, you'd create an e-marker by pushing the button on the device. And you could create up to 10 markers on this key ring. And when you got home, you could plug it into your Windows 98 PC using the USB-A connector, and it would link you to a website where you could buy the CD, the cassette tape, or maybe even the vinyl. But do you know what I think? I think people back then probably thought, I don't know, man, that sounds like a lot of work. And apps like Napster were just far easier to use and quicker. And it wasn't long before the captain of an American company called Steve showed up on the scene with a product called the iPod, which changed the game and changed the world forever. And if you think about it, in a way, the Sony e-marker kind of left its own e-mark in history for the point when people stopped buying physical music and started moving more towards downloading and streaming online. Now let's fast forward a decade to 2011, the same year that Game of Thrones was released on TV. Doesn't feel like that long ago, does it? But that was the same year that Sony released a folding tablet. Now I know when you look at the tech landscape today, everything is flipping and folding, phones, tablets, laptops, my wallet is folding up and dying. But back then in 2011, a pocketable tablet was an idea so far ahead of its time. This sunglasses case looking device was known as the Sony Tablet P. It had two displays inside, they actually didn't meet up. The bezels around the screens were thicker than my eyebrows. And they were TFT displays as well, which are not very good when you're not directly in front of them. It did have some positives though. It had a removable battery, micro SD slot, LTE support, it had a headphone jack, and some apps designed by Sony to make use of both the screens. However, from what I'm told, the experience wasn't that great back then with the Android Honeycomb interface, and then combine that with the disappointing displays, and it was hard for a lot of people to get on board with the Sony Folding Tablet P. Even for fans like us with our rose-tinted sunglasses on. See what I did there with the sunglass case reference and the Anyway, let's move on to the next one, number seven. All right, let's go back in time again to 1988. And remember the story I told you about the Super Walkman that couldn't fit a cassette inside? Well, five years after that, Sony did it again, except this time with a CD player. The world's smallest CD player to be precise. So small, it couldn't actually fit a CD in it. Well, not a regular one anyway. Regular CDs measured 12 by 12 centimeters. The device was actually around nine centimeters, but it could still play CDs. And when you did play a regular CD on it, it kind of turned it into a zombie killing compact disc saw. And this sounds dangerous, but from what I'm told, it wasn't, even though the CDs did rotate at 780 RPM. But check this out, back then, there was such a thing known as a CD single. And these were smaller than regular CDs at eight centimeters in diameter, which meant you could play them on the D88 Discman in the proper closed position. And there was even a dust seal to protect the CD inside. Presumably, this means you could actually walk around with it in your pocket and play music. But the eight centimeter CD singles at the time were quite rare. And the purpose of a Discman or a Walkman was to carry it around and listen to music on the go. And that's why this one is a little weird. I get the thinking though, Sony gained a lot of exposure from being the world's first to do things. And they did indeed make the world's smallest Discman with the D88, but who was it really for? And do you know what I think? It doesn't matter who it was for. It was a legendary device in my book. It could run off the mains. It had a detachable lithium ion battery pack. It came with a wired remote control, wired earbuds, and even a Sony branded hard carry case. And if you don't think the D88 was awesome, what's in your head? Zombie. Number eight. So some of the most successful people on the planet share a similar trait. They're cool under pressure. So maybe in order to be successful, all you need to do is be cool. With a product like this from Sony, the world's first pocketable air conditioner is called the Rion Pocket and it was released in 2020 for around $200. And we are on the Rion Pocket 3 today. It's a personal air conditioner and it's not really designed to be used in the pocket. Instead, you would switch it on and hang it around your neck or fit it into a pocket in your shirt and you would use it whenever you felt a little bit too hot under the collar or for when you're getting grilled by the boss. 
Now, if the portable air conditioning unit isn't a weird enough idea for you, maybe this will tip it over the edge. Sony did sell this with a specific t-shirt designed with a pocket at the back of your neck for the Rion pocket. Now, I do think Sony realized that maybe putting another t-shirt, another layer on under your work shirt, for example, may be counterintuitive. But you know what I think? It doesn't matter. And let's not stray from the point. This is the world's first and likely the world's smallest personal air conditioning unit on the planet. It has an intake and an exhaust system and a fairly large silicon contact mat to rest on or close to the surface of your skin. And it's this mat that delivers the cooling sensation. Now, remember that story at the beginning of the video about the Japanese Tony Stark building the product in the burnt out tower of a old department store and eventually turning the parts into heating pads. Well, how about this for going full circle? The Rion Pocket doubles up as a heating pad. How about that? How about that? And is controllable via an app. Some might call it strange, some might call it weird or even genius. But one thing's for sure, the Sony Rion Pocket is cool. And at the right time, at the right place, I'm sure Sony could sell these like sweet bean paste hotcakes. All right, so I couldn't resist putting at least one Sony Vio product in this lineup since I do have a history of working with Sony, particularly under the Vio banner. And that was the year that they actually closed the Sony Vio business, but that had nothing to do with me. But I did get some insight into the actual brand itself. And let me share an interesting fact with you. I'm just gonna say it, the Sony Vio logo is probably one of the greatest logos ever made. And it was created around the time when things were transitioning from analog to digital. Now look at this, the V and the A are kind of a smooth line, like an analog wave. And the I and O look like binary code. Digital, it's just brilliant tells a story and it also tells you the name of the product. And this is the Vio UX. Now, there were various versions of the Vio UX, but to explain it simply, the Vio UX was a full Windows handheld portable PC. It was released a year before the first iPhone and it had a better screen than the first iPhone, as well as a fingerprint scanner, a rear facing and a selfie camera. It had a built-in mic, expandable memory, USB ports, headphone jack, as well as a full QWERTY keyboard, a mouse stick, a stylus, and it had Intel inside. It also supported Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and cellular signals. It was kind of like a Blackberry on steroids, like the Liver King. I'm making this video to apologize because I up. But it gets better. It shipped with a docking station, and when you connected it to the docking station, you had more USB ports. It had a VGA output, an Ethernet input, FireWire, it also had pass-through power for charging the device. The Vio UX had so much potential, but maybe it just kind of lacked the finesse of the iPhone and it was quite big and clunky, but it could have been so much more. And there's actually a community of people who were modding these devices. Someone actually fitted one with an SSD and a PlayStation controller and upgraded everything inside it and turned it into a kind of Sony Steam Deck. And the Vio UX was so ahead of its time, it even featured in Terminator Salvation, the movie. <laughs> you don't get much more futuristic than that. All right, number 10. Curiosity is the key to creativity. And let me know in the comments if you know where that quote comes from. And have you ever looked at a phone and wondered, what's going on behind the scenes that I can't see? Well, the Sony Ericsson team clearly did because they came up with this phone, the Sony Xperia, Pureness, a transparent phone that you could look straight through. It had a monochrome 1.8 inch QVJ 240 by 320 pixel display. It had a four by three ratio and 222 pixels per inch. And apparently this display looked better under bright light than it did at night. And inside it had two gigabytes of onboard storage for music. It also had the Netfront browser built in so you could browse the web on it. And it had an FM radio tuner. It was stylish, it was innovative, it was unique, and it was a bit weird. And I'd love to tell you that this phone had it all, but really the word emptiness is what best describes this phone. Especially when you look at the display, it kind of looks empty, like it's not even there. Emptiness also represents the lack of features that were available compared to the other smartphones at the time in 2009. And emptiness also represents what my bank would have looked like had I bought one at the time because this retailed for around a thousand pounds. So clearly the Xperia Pureness was designed with rich people in mind. And if you did actually buy one, there was even a concierge service you could use with the purpose-built onboard software. 
Now I heard the Sony Pureness didn't sell that well, but you know what you gotta respect about Sony Xperia devices in general? All the way up until today's devices, you can see Sony aren't scared to make them different. And from this video, you probably learned the Sony are really fearless when it comes to making their products stand out. Some might say that some Sony devices are a bit too out there, a bit too unusual, or a bit too weird. But you know what's weird to me? All of the people and the companies that are trying so hard to be just like everybody else. And on that bombshell, if you want to see why the smell of coffee reminds me of my trip to Amsterdam with Sony, that thumbnail's on screen right now. And there were a bunch of products on my list that didn't make it into this video. So if you want a part two to this, let me know in the comments below. And if I get enough comments, I will make that video for you guys. Anyway, appreciate you. If you just subscribed, you're now one of the finest subscribers known to man, and I will see you in the next one. Don't be late.